very much for being here today. This is, I think, stop 42 or 43 on my tour around the province. I've been on tour since the uh, middle of October promoting the Sensible BC campaign and spreading the word about how we can change the cannabis laws here in British Columbia. So my name is Dana Larson and I've been working on the field of cannabis law reform for pretty much all of my adult life. As a student at Simon Fraser, I started a club called the League for Ethical Action on Drugs. Uh, when I graduated, I met Mark Emery and went to work on Cannabis Culture magazine for 10 years. Mark, of course, is now sitting in a prison in Yazoo, Mississippi for selling marijuana seeds by mail order to Americans, but really he's in jail for funding the marijuana movement to the tune of about $4 million over several years uh, when he was most active. Uh, I helped uh, create the BC Marijuana Party and the Canadian Marijuana Party, and I ran as a candidate for both of those. Uh, I joined the NDP in 2003, and uh, I created a group within the NDP called End to Prohibition that works to develop better marijuana and drug policies. And in 2011, I ran for the leadership of the BC NDP. I also opened the Vancouver Sea Gang in 2005, and in 2008, I opened the Vancouver Medicinal Cannabis Dispensary. And we now serve about 4,000 patients from two locations in the Lower Mainland and across Canada by mail. And in all this time that I've been working in this field of marijuana policy reform, people have often said to me, Dana, what are you getting so worked up over? It's, it's just a matter of time until these laws change. It's inevitable that marijuana is going to be legalized. It's going to happen any day now, so why, why bother with all this effort? It's inevitable. And I disagree very greatly with that, because nothing is inevitable. And these kind of changes, to, to change this law, requires hard work and effort, sacrifice, time and money, all those things are required to make this happen. And I feel in many ways that where we are today is very similar to where we were in the late 1970s. The late 1970s, everyone thought marijuana was about to be legalized. And in Canada, we had Conservative Prime Minister Joe Clark and Liberal Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau both talking about how it was time to change these laws. And in the US, Jimmy Carter was saying the same thing, that the laws against marijuana were more harmful than cannabis itself. Many American states were having referendums and passing laws to decriminalize cannabis, taking it out, uh, not letting people with possession go to prison, but instead treating it as a, a lesser offense and giving them a fine or something like that. So everyone thought it was about to change and it was inevitable, and yet a whole generation has gone by. And for the most part, these laws have only gotten worse. But we have had a lot of successes over the last 20 years. A lot of things have changed when it comes to cannabis and marijuana uh, reform. Uh, for instance, uh, bombs and pipes, harm reduction devices, and vaporizers are also widely available across Canada. You couldn't get a bong or a pipe anywhere uh, 20 years ago. If you wanted to smoke cannabis, you had to punch some holes in a tin can and, and make a little pipe that way. So now we have medical grade uh, glass pipes and, and water pipes available, and vaporizers are widely available. Grow books and magazines and information about how to use cannabis and how to produce it were also not really available at all in Canada 20 years ago. Uh, and in fact, the law against books and against paraphernalia is still on the books. Section 462.2 of the Criminal Code mandates six months in prison and a $100,000 fine for selling or even promoting uh, any kind of uh, harm reduction devices, pipes, bongs, or literature as well. It's all still banned under the law. Uh, you couldn't grow, there was no hemp being grown in Canada 20 years ago. And now we have a thriving hemp industry, although it's still too tightly restricted with red tape, and there's some problems there, and nevertheless, Hemp seed food products and hemp clothing are being produced in Canada and they're pretty widely available across our country right now. Uh, 20 years ago, public opinion was against changing the marijuana laws, whereas now, especially in British Columbia, we have a strong majority. About 85% of British Columbians don't believe that possession of cannabis should be a criminal offense, and about two thirds of British Columbians would like to see cannabis legalized, regulated, and brought to the mainstream. And, uh, and so, what we've had some victories and some changes over the last uh, 20 years. The only area the law has actually changed is when it allowed hemp cultivation. Every other aspect of what we're doing, the law has really not changed at all. The law is simply not being enforced. And that especially is true in the bigger cities across Canada. The further north you go and the more rural of a community you live in, the less chance you're gonna be able to uh, purchase a bong or a pipe or seeds and the greater chance you're gonna get harassed or arrested for using cannabis. And when I look at the actual victories that we've had and how to change the law, and the law has actually been changed, we look to our neighbors to the south. And we see, certainly in Washington and Colorado, they had these amazing electoral victories recently, and also Massachusetts at the same time. Massachusetts became the 18th state to legalize the medical access of cannabis uh, at the same time. And that's an average of more than one state a year allowing medical marijuana since 
California became the first one in 1996. And in every one of those instances, where American states, the two states that have legalized, or the many states that allow medical marijuana use and access, in every single case, it was not a top-down uh, procedure where the government decided to be, magnanimous, to be magnanimous and change the laws. It was bottom-up, through referendums, through ballot initiatives, through citizens getting together, writing their own laws, having a vote, and forcing their legislators to put these laws into practice. Well, in British Columbia, we are the only province that also has a ballot initiative and a referendum system. So we're the only province in Canada where citizens can get together, can write their own law, can have a vote on it, and get it on the books and get it passed. Uh, but it's very challenging to do that in British Columbia. It's actually harder in British Columbia than in any American state, or indeed in any referendum system around the world that I know of. There's a higher threshold of signatures required to get something on the ballot here in British Columbia. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But, uh, but I got together with a guy named Kirk Tussaud. He's a brilliant lawyer. He's won many important victories for us in the courts, constitutional challenges, both to curb some of the excesses of the drug war and to help uh, patients get access to the medicines they need. Recently, he won a great case here in Victoria, uh, defending Owen Smith, who was producing products for Ted Smith's bakery, uh, for Ted Smith dispensary. And uh, the result of that court case is that the judge agreed that patients should have the right to access not just whole, dried, smokable cannabis, but also extracts and foods and tinctures and things like that as well. So Kirk and I got together and we wrote a law for British Columbia that would decriminalize cannabis possession in BC and start us on the road to legalization. We call this law the Sensible Policing Act. People often say, well, how can you do that? These are federal laws. How can British Columbia change a federal law? And well, we can't change the federal law as a province, but Every province in Canada has jurisdiction over policing and over the administration of justice. And it is the duty and the responsibility of the British Columbia government, and especially the Attorney General, to direct all police in British Columbia, the RCMP, municipal police, and the traffic police, in terms of where to focus their resources, their time, and their money, and where not to focus their resources and their time and their money. So the Sensible Policing Act has two parts. And the first part would essentially decriminalize cannabis possession in British Columbia by amending the Police Act. And the Police Act is what empowers all police in BC to do their jobs and to have their authority. And we amend the Police Act by telling all police in BC to no longer spend any time or resources on searching, seizing, detaining, or arresting anybody for simple possession of cannabis. To make that the absolute lowest priority such that they spend no time and no resources on that at all. People sometimes say to me, isn't that the case already? Like, I was smoking a joint, the cops told me to put it out, and I didn't get charged. And especially if you live in Vancouver, that is very true. In Vancouver, the Vancouver Police Department has a policy of not bothering people or laying charges for cannabis possession that they can avoid. And they lay less than 10 cannabis possession charges every year in, British, in, in Vancouver. But across the rest of British Columbia, cannabis possession charges have been skyrocketing. In 2005, they trickled down slowly and they were at a low point of about 1,700 possession charges every year. At that time, you might recall, the federal liberal government was talking about decriminalization, it was kind of in the air, and the police were laying less cannabis possession charges. In 2006, Stephen Harper came to power and we saw a jump of about 30% of possession charges in British Columbia in that year. Every year since then, the number of possession charges has gone up. In 2010, it had doubled, and by 2011, the last year we have stats for, there was 3,700 possession charges laid in British Columbia. That's only the possession charges. Now, police have about 20,000 incidences where they file a report about taking someone's cannabis away or somebody having a possession offense. That is up 30% from where it was in 2005. So we're seeing the police spending an increasing amount of time dealing with cannabis, cannabis possession and have more than double the number of charges that they're laying. Now, there might have been a slight increase in cannabis use over the last six years, but it certainly has not been 30%, and it definitely has not doubled. This is not a response to what's happening in the public. This is the RCMP primarily on their own, taking the initiative and deciding to crack down on cannabis users in our province. So this law would stop that. It would get that number down from 3,700 to as close to zero as we could possibly get it. Now to deal with minors in possession of cannabis, the Sensible Policing Act treats a minor with possession of cannabis the same as, but no more severely than, a minor in possession of alcohol. A police officer would be entitled or empowered to seize cannabis from a minor and to write them a ticket if they chose, but there'd be no arresting, no handcuffing, no criminal record, none of those things that can really haunt somebody for the rest of their life. And a minor with a medical permit or something like that would, of course, be exempt from that procedure. 
So that's the first part of this law, to decriminalize cannabis possession in British Columbia. But we want to go further than that. We recognize that just decriminalizing possession is not the final solution to dealing with the issues around cannabis and cannabis use in our province, but it's a great first step. It takes cannabis users off the front lines of the war on drugs. It allows our police to reprioritize their, their resources towards more substantive criminal offenses. And it sends a strong message that in British Columbia, we're tired of the war on cannabis, and we want to do something different. But we have the second part of the Sensible Policing Act. And what the second part does is it mandates the Attorney General of British Columbia to formally call upon the federal government and demand that they change the marijuana laws federally or at least give British Columbia an exemption, which they have the power to do. The Federal Minister of Health has the power to, to exempt any person or any class of persons from any aspect of the drug laws that they choose. They can do that for public health, <coughs> for scientific research, or for, for many other reasons. So they have the power to let British Columbia go our own way. And in fact, when we had alcohol prohibition, that's how it was done. Every province decided on their own if they wanted to ban alcohol or not. And Quebec was the last one in and the first one out of alcohol prohibition. And until recently, you couldn't bring alcohol across provincial borders. That dated back to the time when different provinces had different laws around alcohol. So along with the end of the federal government change the law, this, this legislation also sets up a commission at the provincial level to figure out the details needed to legalize in, in British Columbia. What are the age limits? What's the point of sale? How do we tax it? Do people grow their own? If so, how much? How do we deal with medical use? All those kind of questions that need to be resolved. So that when the federal government says, yes, we're going to change the law and let you do something different, we've already got a system in place. We've already figured out what those rules and regulations are going to be. So we're not no longer debating if we should change the cannabis laws. We're debating what are we going to change them to? How are we going to make a program that will work in British Columbia? So this would be a wonderful law to see passed. I certainly would be very happy to see this law put into place. But how do we do that? Well, our political leaders could pass this law now if they wanted to. Christy Clark could recall the legislature, have this law put in force this week. And if the polls are right and Adrian Dix becomes our next premier, he could also pass this law without any problems at all. It's entirely within provincial jurisdiction. But although we should be pushing, putting pressure on our political leaders, and certainly I encourage you to talk to your MLAs, to make an appointment, to, to give them a call or an email and say, hey, I heard about the Sensible Policing Act. Do you support this? Will you put this into law? Where do you stand on this? And find out what they say. But if history shows correctly, I believe that we will need to have a referendum here in British Columbia to really get this law through. And certainly, if we win a referendum on this, it will be a, a much stronger statement from the people of British Columbia that we want to see these laws change. It will be very difficult to not have this law pass once we win a referendum. But like I said, to have a referendum in British Columbia is very challenging. To get something on the ballot in our province, you need to get the signatures from 10% of the registered voters in every single one of British Columbia's 85 electoral districts. If you get just 9.9% in one district, we do not get on the ballot and the initiative fails. So, and you only have 90 days to collect all those signatures as well. You only have three months to get everybody signed up and, and registered for this campaign. So what we've done is, is in September, Kirk and I filed with Elections BC, we gave them our law, and we actually had to go back and forth a little bit to, to work out the details because they won't let you have a referendum on a law which is not a valid law. If they feel that it's unconstitutional or outside of BC's jurisdiction, then you can't have a vote on it, it's not a valid law. So by getting Elections BC to agree to this and say we can have a referendum, that already is a big step forward because next time our political leaders say, well, I can't do anything, it's a federal law, I'm powerless before the federal government. That is simply not true. You could say, no, Elections BC says that we can pass a sensible policing act in British Columbia. So you can't have that cop out anymore. And I'll add that we actually have a number of precedences for the provinces standing up for the federal government on these kind of issues. And one, uh, one that was a quite a significant issue was the, gun, the Long Gun Registry, the Gun Registry Act. And, and British Columbia in 2003 joined seven other provinces across Canada. And attorney generals told the federal government, we're not going to enforce this law. They said this law is criminalizing otherwise law-abiding citizens and that it's costing us a lot of money we can't afford and no one is following this law anyways. So we're not going to refuse to enforce it. Now however you feel about the gun registry, all those things also apply to cannabis use. No one's following the cannabis possession laws. It's costing a lot of money we can't afford and it's criminalizing otherwise law-abiding citizens. So if they stood up for people in possession of an unregistered long gun, essentially decriminalizing possession of an unregistered long gun by not enforcing the law, they can do the exact same thing to decriminalize possession of cannabis as well. Another recent example is a supervised injection site, Insight, in Vancouver, 
The federal government said, hey, we control drug policy. We want to shut that place down, close it. And British Columbia and Vancouver went to court, and they said, no, this place saves lives, it increases public safety, it reduces disorder. We want to keep it open. And you know what? They won that case. In both instances, the province beats the, provinces beat the federal government. There's no more long gun registry, and insight is still there. So when the provinces stand up to the federal government, they can win. So we have this law, we want to get it passed. We need 10% of the registered voters to sign on board. So we submitted in September. Elections BC said, great, let's start the 90 day clock right now. And we said, okay, good, but we're going to withdraw this legislation. We're not going to try to collect all the signatures just yet. I know they're out there. Polls show that we have far more than 10% of the registered voters in every riding who would sign on to this campaign. What we lack so far is organizational infrastructure. The only other people ever to get something on the ballot was the anti-HST campaign. They had the unions, they had the NDP, they had businesses, they had a broad coalition of groups on board. But polls show that we have more widespread support in British Columbia for getting rid of the cannabis laws than we did for getting rid of the HST. So our plan is to resubmit this legislation in September and to start that 90-day clock for September, October, November of this year. And between now and then, my goal is to find local volunteers, to get people pre-registered for our campaign so that when, when the time comes it's in September, our volunteers don't have to go knocking on random doors or go to the mall and find random people. We can say, here's the 100 people in your neighborhood who already said they're gonna sign, they're already registered, they're waiting for you to show up. Just go get their signatures and file that paperwork. We'll have a big head start going into this campaign. That's our only chance to succeed. The threshold is so high it's virtually impossible just to hit the ground running and get all the signatures you need in 90 days without a long lead up time. And no one's ever tried this strategy before, spending so long in advance building up <coughs> to get something on the ballot. Now the way our referendum system works, and nobody knows how it works because it's totally unused, it's only ever been used once, but the way it works is we have fixed referendum dates, fixed dates for the referendums. They're separate from the provincial election system, they're separate from the municipal votes, it's its own entire system. And we're supposed to have a referendum every three years in September to vote on whatever issues people got enough signatures for to get on the ballot. So the next referendum in British Columbia is scheduled for September of next year, September 2014. So if we succeed in getting the signatures that we need over the next three months, over the next three months from September to October, November, I should say, of the coming year, during those three months, then the referendum will be held next year in September. Now I'm very confident that we will win that referendum. We've got broad-based support, but the hard part is getting on the ballot, getting, that, getting, getting the signatures we need to have this vote happen. And, uh, and so, you know, this is something that we've been working on for such a long time in this province, and, and people have been struggling for this for so many years, and we finally got a very special opportunity where so many things have come together to make this our chance to change the laws. You know, we've had the, the mayors and councils all across British Columbia coming together last September to call for decriminalization and then legalization of cannabis. The group Stop the Violence has done a great job of getting former attorney generals and former mayors and current politicians, four liberal MLAs have come out recently supporting changing the cannabis laws and, and, and decriminalizing and then legalizing in British Columbia. This is a very special opportunity for us right now. But we cannot waste this opportunity or we'll find ourselves like in the late 1970s where we had a chance to change the laws and it'll slip out of our grasp. And that is not what I want to have to see happen. And you know, I've got a daughter who's, who's 15 years old and some of you might have kids of your own or might be expecting to have some one day. And I would love it if her children could grow up in a world that does not have cannabis prohibition. They can never know what cannabis prohibition is other than what they, what they read in their history books. And in fact, I want you to imagine this future for me. I like to imagine this future one day when we're older, when we're senior citizens, and you're there with your grandchild, your grandson or granddaughter, and they're, they're reading through their history book, getting ready for school in the morning, doing some homework before, before they go off to school. And they turn to you and they say, Grandma, Grandpa, I was reading in my history book that the cannabis hemp plant used to be illegal. People used to go to jail for growing this plant. It was like a hundred years that, that cannabis was illegal in Canada. And it's just tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people were jailed and billions of dollars were spent putting people in prison and all this effort was made to, to make this plant illegal. But, but I know that our house is built out of cannabis hemp fiber board. And I know that the school bus that takes me to school runs on hemp fuel. And I know we had hemp granola for breakfast, and I'm pretty sure that you use marijuana medicines to help treat the aches and pains of being a senior citizen. So how is it that this plant used to be illegal? What's up with that? 
And I want you to be able to say, yeah, it's true. It's true, very true. And for a long time, this was a huge issue and a, a big debate in our country. And the police were very active in putting lots of people in prison. People who needed marijuana for medical use were jailed as well. It was a, a very scary and dangerous time. But you know what? I made a difference and I got involved. And when Sensible BC came to Victoria, I decided that I was going to work my butt off to make those laws change. And I signed up, and I signed up my friends and my family, and I worked very hard. And, and when I cast that ballot in September 2014 to decriminalize and legalize marijuana in British Columbia, that was the best vote that I ever cast. And I did that so that you would never have to know what it's like to be harassed or arrested for what herbal medicine you use or for what plant you choose to grow in your garden. <coughs> Let's let that be the legacy we leave our children when it comes to cannabis law. Let's not pass this, this futile and destructive war off to yet another generation and force our children and grandchildren to continue this battle. We have a very special opportunity, a unique chance over the next few years to finally see the end of cannabis prohibition in British Columbia. And none of us here, even the oldest people in this room, none of us have ever lived in a time where marijuana was legal and where cannabis was allowed to grow freely in our country. And when we look back from the future, when we look back on the days of cannabis prohibition from that time when this plant is legal, we will see much more clearly the harms and the destruction and the damage that these laws have done, personally, financially, socially, economically, every single way, how much harm the laws against cannabis and the greater drug war did to our society and to our country and to our province. And so I hope you will join me in this quest to change these laws, to get the Sensible Policing Act passed in British Columbia. We can do this here in our province. We can do it here, starting in Victoria, right here, right now. And I'm not asking very much. I'm asking you to sign up, to register with our group. If you sign up online already, you don't need to sign the form again. But more importantly, to spread the words to your friends and family, to your neighbor and co-workers, to your fellow students here at UFIT, to get them to also register and sign up. Get one of those forms, give it to your friends and family, get them to fill it out, mail it or fax it or scan it, email it back to us so that we can build our database so that we know where our support is, is built, where we know where people will back us, and where we know where we're weak and we can work harder. So that when we come to September, we have a big head start so we can really get this law changed. It's not that hard, but it requires a little hard work, a little dedication, a little bit of money, a little bit of time from everybody here in this room. And I've been traveling all around the province. I've talked to hundreds and hundreds of people in every part of this province so far, I've been all through the interior, all through the north, and we'll be doing a lot of events in the lower mainland as well over the, over the coming weeks. And people everywhere I go are very excited to get involved, they're taking sign-up forms, they're, they're getting out there, they're making a difference, and you can do that too. So it's not just us here in this room. When you join the Sensible BC campaign, you are joining a movement of people all around British Columbia who are struggling and working together to take advantage of this special opportunity we have to finally end the war on cannabis once and for all beginning here in British Columbia. And I assure you that if we pass this law here in British Columbia, it will spread across the rest of Canada. Within a few short years, we will see marijuana legalized all across this country of ours. But if we fail in getting this on the ballot now, I, I worry that there isn't any other path for us to fully change these laws in Canada, and we're gonna see our opportunity potentially slip away. So I hope you'll join me to change these laws and make this positive change happen. It's a special chance Let's do it now, starting right here in Victoria at the university right here. Thank you very much for being here. I'm happy to answer any questions and talk more about cannabis policy. Thank you very much. And I'm more than happy to answer questions about anything from the Central BC campaign, medical marijuana program, anything else you want to talk about. Um, one of the, probably the most encouraging factors is when we talk about how much money could be saved by by the legalization and adequate taxing of this so that it can go into our healthcare system that those extra dollars that seem to get wasted with our police force can now go to the healthcare, you know, side Absolutely. of things, you know, and, and, and um, Well, we've been doing, you know, there's been a study recently, they estimated about $500 million would be generated in British Columbia every year through a legally taxed and regulated system. Uh, I've got a professor named Neil Boyd from Simon Fraser University, he's a criminologist, we hired him to do a study to find out who are these 3,700 people and why do they get charged and what makes them different from the 20,000 people that don't get charged every year. And one of the things he's come up with recently is that we're spending close to $20 million a year in British Columbia just to arrest and charge and harass marijuana users. Just to go after the tokers, we're spending about $20 million a year. That number's gone up substantially over the last seven years and if <coughs> trends continue, <coughs> that number will continue to increase quite dramatically over the next several years. I expect possession charges to keep going up in British Columbia 
unless we win this campaign and change the laws. Uh, so a lot of money is being spent just purely on busting pot smokers, and we said 500 million could be saved or could be generated. And Alad, I'm not sure if that 500 million number includes some of the sort of ancillary businesses. Like for instance, I don't think you have too many vapor lounges here, but there's a couple of really busy ones in Vancouver. And they make a lot of money and are quite busy. They don't sell cannabis at all. They really provide a place to go and use it safely. So there's a lot of other kinds of businesses around that that would also be uh, generating revenue as well. There's a lot there, absolutely. Absolutely. Toronto's had a real expansion in vapor lounges over the last couple of years. There was only a few there for several years, and now I think there's more than 10, yeah. probably, maybe not quite 20, but in there somewhere, in the teens somewhere anyway, and quite a few have expanded it. And, and really, even if you don't, if you, I mean, I'm assuming everybody here is kind of friendly to cannabis, but even those who don't like cannabis, who say, I don't like the smell, or I don't like that, well, wouldn't you rather people do it indoors, somewhere safely, where they can be monitored, where they're not going to be bothering you by smoking on the street? The reason people smoke outdoors on the street is because they have nowhere else to go for the most part. You often can't do it in your home. Your friends or parents or family won't let you. If you're in an apartment, you can be evicted for using cannabis. There isn't a lot of places to go always. So having vapor lounges and places open, people can go and use cannabis in a safe and responsible way. And if they have any problems, there's people there to help them with it. If there is any issues, that's really the way to go. What we need to see more of across Canada, these kind of licensed venues, you can use cannabis safely indoors. Well, do they have those cafes in DC anywhere? Uh, not in Victoria, but uh, Mark Emery's, or I guess Jody Emery's Cannabis uh, uh, Culture Lounge in Vancouver at Hastings and Canby. They've got two floors of vapor lounge space. Um, there's a few other smaller ones in Vancouver, but that's the only real sort of big main one that's there right now. Um, I would love to see more open up, and I'm not quite sure why there's so few in Vancouver compared to Toronto, but these things seem to go in waves. You know, in, in Vancouver, there's been a huge expansion in dispensaries over the last two or three years. We went from three dispensaries to about 15 right now in the city, so there's a lot, a lot of opened up. And in Toronto, the expansion has really been, there's quite a few dispensaries there, but they've had an explosion of, of vapor lounges. They've really expanded there as well. And uh, especially here in Victoria, uh, because in Victoria, the, the bylaws only ban tobacco smoking. They don't actually ban marijuana smoking. So technically, in, in, in most areas, a vaporizer is not considered smoking. So in Vancouver, the bylaw does include cannabis smoking, but they've said a vaporizer is not smoking, so we're fine with that. And people also smoke in those places as well, and the city usually turns a blind eye to that too. But uh, in, in Victoria, under the letter of the law, only tobacco smoking is banned indoors. So a, a place that let you smoke cannabis wouldn't even be breaking any bylaws in Victoria. And I'd love to see some open up here. It's also uh, worth, worth mentioning that in Victoria we have the highest per capita arrest rates in terms of drug, all, drug arrest and cannabis arrest in all of BC, and some of the highest in Canada. So this is an issue that, that is really live here in Victoria. We've got a uh, rate of arrest through the Victoria police that's absolutely inexcusable at a time when we're saying that we, and the police constantly tell us they only have so much time in terms of priorities and otherwise. So I think that it's, it's important for us to keep in mind that in a city like this, you know, I'm 43 years old. I'm not coming at, in a contact with police on, on cannabis related issues. Uh, it's really uh, those 50 to 25 year old males, visible minorities, uh, people living on our streets who are coming in contact. And you're absolutely right in mentioning that most people don't go to jail for cannabis use, for recreational cannabis use anymore, unless of course you're on probation, unless it's a restriction of your, your release or otherwise. And then just having a simple joint on you and, and having a police incident can lead yet to you ending up back in jail. So there are circumstances where we are seeing a single joint leading people back to jail as well. Well, absolutely, that, that's very true, that's very true. And, uh, and absolutely, these laws are often, they're enforced so arbitrarily as well. You know, out of those 20,000 people, only 3,700 get charged. I say only, it's a big number of people, but it's a very arbitrary decision on the choice of the police, who to charge and who not to charge. And they charge about one person in six. I don't know of any other kind of crime where the police let five out of six people go and only charge one in six. And really, police say, well, we have to enforce the law. Well, fine. If they were to charge 20,000 British Columbians with cannabis possession every year, there would be an outcry, and these laws would change a lot faster. So they absolutely have discretion. 
And if they have the discretion to double the number of charges in six years, they have the discretion to half or quarter the number of charges as well. So when they say, oh, we're just enforcing the law, we don't have any choice, that is baloney. They have a huge amount of discretion. They have a huge amount of power. And I'll add that recently Shirley Bond, our Attorney General, we signed a contract with the RCMP, a new contract for 20 years, and she was boasting how this contract gave us unprecedented powers and problems over how the police spend their money and over what the RCMP priorities are. She said that municipalities will have far more control over the spending the police do and to make sure that they're spending their money and their priorities in the way that the cities want them to. And yet, all of our cities and towns passed a resolution calling for decriminalization of cannabis, but the RCMP have not been responding to that at all. Yeah, how does that apply to the RCMP? It would apply equally to the RCMP and to local police as well. And I'll add that by making it in the Police Act, if a police officer were to go against that and charge or even just take your cannabis away from possession, you could launch a complaint through the police process to, to deal with that. You put a secondary burden on them as well, which it might actually be stronger in some ways. It's a very heavy paperwork burden. And if they, if they, any action the police take in terms of cannabis possession, they have to write a report as to why they chose to do that and all the circumstances around it. And that report, minus the details of the person, the personal details of the person who was charged or had their cannabis taken away, that gets published on the Ministry of the Attorney General's website. And so ultimately, police do not like paperwork. If they have to spend a couple of hours writing a report every time they take someone's cannabis away, that will also act as a huge break on their ability to bust or even just interfere with over cannabis possession. So they're going to write a big report. Plus, you could also launch a complaint against them formally uh, for violating that act, that section of the police act. But it applies to the RCMP, municipal police, transit police. All of them fall under the same legislation. RCMP are provincial police officers by contract and by legislation. They're part of a national force, but when they're working in BC, they are provincial police officers subject to the oversight and control of the Provincial Attorney General and the BC Police Act. Uh, you had a question, then I'll go to you. Yeah, I uh, was just wondering, um, I'm sure this is all available on the website and whatnot, but um, I'm wondering about the legal mechanism you're going to actually use to be able to um, keep this law around. In other words, uh, even if it is passed, I mean, it's still, there's it's there's a defense in the criminal code and that sort of thing, which is outside of BC's purview. So um, what 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 did you see, um, or what, what has been done to sort of address that? You mean that the federal government tried to fight it in some way or something like that? Or well, you yeah, mean that I the mean, province refused, the police refused to enforce it, or? It's open, it's open for the federal government to oppose it, right? Because they would be so hard pressed. Yes, you're yeah. right. I mean, the federal government, Stephen Harper, could sue British Columbia, could go to court and fight us. I say bring it on. Because I tell you this, we will, we will, the timeline for this, we get the signatures in September 2013, mm -hmm. we have the vote in September 2014, mm -hmm. the law would come into force early 2015. The criminalization would take place pretty instantly, and then we'd be calling on the federal government to change the law and start this commission. In late 2015, we have our next federal election. If we win a referendum in BC, even those who aren't really into it will say, we had a referendum, we're a democracy, let's do it. We've seen this in the states where both the papers in Washington and Colorado that opposed the referendum and said we shouldn't vote for it are now saying, well, we passed it, let's do it. We had a vote, let's do it. And so if the federal government, if the federal conservative government wants to go to battle with British Columbia against a referendum during an election year, six months before a federal election, that will not do them well. They need seats in British Columbia. This will put the federal conservatives in a very awkward position because they won't like this law, but for them to go against the will of British Columbia and for them to say, no, we want you to bust 4,000 cannabis users every year in British Columbia. We want you to keep spending $20 million a year to bust these people. That's not going to go over well. It'll be very challenging. And hopefully, Harper will be defeated in 2015, and we will see either the Liberals or the, or the NDP or some combination of the two taking power. And although both parties of those parties have got better marijuana policies, and the Liberals especially are talking about cannabis quite a bit recently, but I do not think that either party would just legalize marijuana all across the country when they came into power. They'd probably pull back the mandatory minimums. They'd probably work in good faith to create a medical, mar medical marijuana program. They might talk about decriminalization in some way. But, but if we have this referendum and we win the referendum, it's easiest for the prime minister to say, OK, we're going to let British Columbia try something different. We're not going to force Saskatchewan to legalize marijuana if they don't want it. We're not going to impose it on anybody else. But we're going to let BC, they had a referendum, we're going to let BC try and experiment and see what happens. And if it works out that there's causes all kinds of problems and there's 
fires and violence and explosions and murders and death because of legal marijuana, then hey, maybe we'll shut it down. But that's not going to happen. Once we get it going, it's going to be a huge success. It's going to save a lot of money, going to generate a lot of money, going to reduce a lot of crime and violence, going to have a lot of positive results, and other provinces will want to get on board. But ultimately, the federal government could try to challenge this if they wanted to, but they're going to lose if they do. And it'll, they'll lose not only in court, but they will lose a lot of support across British Columbia. And I'll add that a lot of conservative voters don't support the war on cannabis. There's plenty of people who voted for Stephen Harper, who voted conservative, who support him on other issues. They're just not voting on the marijuana issue, but they don't agree with him on that one. There's plenty, including many of the papers that endorsed Harper. Many, in the last election, many newspapers endorsed Harper. They said, we're not into this mandatory minimum stuff or this drug war stuff, but he's got a strong hand in the economy. We can't let the socialists take over. Something like that, right? So there's certainly a lot of people who would, who would rather not see this war on cannabis happen. And I think that it would, it would do a lot of damage to the Harper Conservatives if they went to court or tried to fight against the democratic will of the people of British Columbia and demand that we keep busting 4,000 cannabis users every year. So that's, I think, how that would probably play out. Um, could you give us an indication as to how lobbying efforts are going with NLAs and the four main political parties? Um, and is it possible that BC will see the Sensible Policing Act or a similar measure for the legislature prior to 2014? Possible but highly unlikely, I would say. Um, we've had four liberal MLAs recently come out in favor of, of decriminalization or really legalization in BC. I don't think any of them are running again in the next election. Is that right? I'm pretty sure none of them are running again, which is why they feel empowered to come out and say this, right? You almost always get it. The politicians who talk about marijuana reform are either at the very beginning of their career or the very end of their career. But for the vast middle stretch, they're normally afraid of it, right? And the closer you get to power, the less likely you are to talk about it. When the NDP was in distant third place federally, they were much more amenable to talk about marijuana law. Now they're in second place and looking towards becoming the governing party, they're a lot more welcome to talk about it. Many in the federal caucus are, are very supportive. I know many of them personally. They'd love to see a change. They normally say, we'll talk about it after we gain power. Don't make us talk about it beforehand. Provincially, along with the Liberals, the, uh, we had Nicholas Simons, the NDP MLA from the Sunshine Coast. He came and spoke at an event we put on in Victoria in September. We had about 500 people come out for a big event, and we had a panel discussion, and he was on that panel. And I know many others in the NDP caucus would love to see these laws change, but they don't want to campaign on changing the marijuana laws. They don't think that's going to win them the election. And in BC, the NDP are in the mode of don't make any mistakes. We're probably going to win the election, so just don't do anything controversial. Just be quiet. Let the Liberals drift into oblivion. We're going to win. Don't screw it up. So they're reluctant to bring on this issue. And I think that goes especially for Adrian Dix. Now, Adrian will say he supports the criminalization. When we ask Adrian and Christy, Christy will say, it's a federal issue. I don't want to talk about it. Adrian will say, I support the criminalization, but it's a federal issue, and I can't do anything about it. So it's a little bit better. But still not really what we want, right? Do, but, do you know if he's mentioned anything about what he would do like, with the Section B of the Sensible Policing Act, pressuring the federal government to make an exception for BC? If he they were, haven't commented on that. And I don't think that's the minimum they could do. He could say, it's a federal issue, but I sure wish they changed the law because it's costing us a lot of money here in BC that we can't afford. And the mandatory minimums especially, any sentence under two years is served in a provincial jail. And there's a few of the minimums that are over two years, but almost all of them are six months, nine months, one year, 18 months kind of penalties. So all those people being charged under the mandatory minimums will be in provincial jails. And that is why we are undergoing what the National Post called the biggest spending spree for prisons since the 1930s. Prisons are being built all across this country, not just for marijuana people, but that's gonna be a big part of it, but to deal with all these increased prisoners we're gonna be seeing coming out of the Harper government because of these laws. The mandatory minimums just came into force in early November. It takes quite a few months for the first people to be charged under those laws, to get into the courts, and, and work their way through the system. But over the next six months or so, we're going to start seeing some charges or some things being brought down because of that, and we're going to see how it all plays out. I hope that we can defeat some of those mandatory minimums in court, but uh, there's no guarantees there. Some of them, I think, are constitutionally weak. And I feel the conservatives actually overplayed their hand. By making six plans, a six-month sentence, to the average person, that seems very extreme, however they feel about cannabis. If they'd only made the penalty start at two or three hundred plants, a lot of people would have said, well, three hundred plants are probably a hell's angel anyways, whatever, right? Even though that's not really true, that might have been the perception. But by making it six plants, or also three kilos of cannabis, trafficking in three kilos also gets you a 
mandatory minimum, which applies to me, my staff in my dispensary, and every other medical dispensary around British Columbia. We all have more than six pounds of cannabis. Six pounds of cannabis is about that much, roughly, right? It's not like that much, really. What's that? It's a blue bit. Yeah, yeah, basically blue bit or something like that. Yeah, it's not really that much cannabis, right? And, uh, and so we'll see how these laws come into force. Typically, they go after the least publicly sympathetic groups first. So the first houses they seize are like a Hells Angels clubhouse or something, but they use that to get a precedent, but these things always expand until they encompass a lot larger number of people. I've kind of answered more than what you asked there, but, but when it comes to them actually putting this law into place, the only way it's gonna happen without a referendum is if we put immense political pressure on our leaders. And so that's why I encourage people to talk to your MLA, give Adrian Dix a call or an email or make an appointment and talk to them about this issue. Now, this, uh, this referendum wouldn't address cultivation or like APC hybrid. Well, it's got the two parts, right? So the immediate effect is just to decriminalize possession, all the other laws that remain in place and be enforced. We can't make a regulatory system in BC without changing the federal law. When I said we tried earlier versions with elections in BC, we, we didn't think it was gonna work, but we tried to create a system where if you were growing less than a certain number of plants, the police would leave you alone. Because I think, you know, being able to grow six plants in your own home would be a great start, right? That's not enough, but it's a good start. We can always make that number bigger later. But we were told by elections BC, and our lawyers confirmed that, that it's simply not within our jurisdiction as a province to sort of make a regulatory system and then do that. But we have a line item veto. We can tell the police, don't enforce this law. So we could have said, don't enforce the law against cultivation, but I don't think most people would vote for that because that would mean that anybody could grow as much cannabis as they want, and that would be, I wouldn't mind that, but that would be a bit too wild west, I think, for people to really pass, right? So that's why we did it the way it does. But the second part, sets up this, this commission to figure out all the details, and once the federal government says yes, you can change the law, that would encompass all the rest of those things. We would figure out how we're gonna deal with buying and selling and growing and all those kind of questions. It's very similar to what they've done in Washington and Colorado, because in those states, the law they pass decriminalizes or legalizes possession immediately. So you can have an ounce of bud in Seattle or in Washington, and in Colorado you can have an ounce of public, and you can also grow six plants in your own home. The Washington one does not allow <clears throat> for home cultivation, which I think is a mistake. I believe you should have the right to grow some plants in your own home, even if it's just six plants. And I know in Colorado they're going to be learning how to grow the biggest plants you've ever seen. If you limit them to six plants, that's how it works. To me, a better way of limiting it is saying like four square meters or something. So you can grow small plants or big plants, but we can work out those kind of things later. But I prefer a space-based limit as opposed to a plant-based limit, just because it makes a little more sense. But I'll, I'll just finish this. But, but so what they've done in those states, they then have a year to figure out how they're going to legalize it. So by next November or thereabouts, they're supposed to have all the rules and laws in place, a legal system of production, um, places they're gonna sell it out of, and all those kind of things. And I expect that the decriminalization of possession part, that's already happened. The federal government can't really stop that. All they can do is they can send in a bunch of DE agents to bust them for possession, but they're not gonna go that far. But when it comes to the legal shops and all that, yeah, Obama has said he's got bigger fish to fry, but he said that about medical marijuana too, and they've still targeted a lot of dispensary operators across the U.S. So I'm hoping that Obama mellows out in his second term, but I'm expecting there'll be some kind of legal battles with those states over setting up those, those shops and those things. But at the same time, many other American states, legislators that are introducing this, it's emboldened everybody, right? And many other countries around the world are saying, well, if you guys are doing, even telling us we can't change the laws, but now you're changing the laws, forget it, we're doing it too, right? And so countries like Guatemala and Uruguay are feeling much more empowered to like talk about and move towards changing those laws. And of course here in BC, when the, one of the biggest fears has always been, okay, you're right, we should legalize marijuana, but America will freak out, they'll shut down the border, it'll cost us all this money, we can never do that. Well, that argument is gone now, right? It's dissipating because when Washington has legal cannabis, when Colorado has legal cannabis, they, they can't make the argument anymore in fact, shouldn't we be shutting our borders down to stop them Washington from coming into here? Like, it makes no sense. So they've lost that moral authority in the U.S. to tell other countries what to do. You had a question? It was a referendum, but it wasn't a ballot initiative. That was like a top-down referendum. Now, the federal government and any provincial government can call a referendum if they want to at any time. They can say, we're going to have a vote to see what people think about this issue. And they don't do that very often, but once in a while they do. Quebec's had referendums on, on leaving Canada. But those weren't people getting signatures. That was the government calling a referendum on their own. And they provide funding. Yeah. So that was only happening over a certain time, so 
No, those ones, they're separate. They can happen whenever they want. The, okay. the BC government can just say, we're going to have a referendum tomorrow on whatever issue we choose. It's not binding. They can do whatever they want on it. It's purely their thing. But the ballot initiative system in British Columbia, where you get signatures to force something on the ballot, that, it's, it's, it's the Ballot Initiative and Recall Act, I think is what it's called, or something like that. It was passed in 1996 or the early 90s, something like that, maybe earlier than that, but in the early 90s. And, uh, and so that system has a referendum supposedly being held every three years. You have to get 10% of the registered voters to sign on and all that kind of stuff. And nobody's ever succeeded in getting something on the ballot before with that system, except for the campaign against CHST. And that recent launching with the food, the marijuana Right. Yes, and, and Health Canada always takes the narrowest interpretation of these things. So what Kirk got the judge to agree with in court was that patients should have the right to access not just whole, dry, smokable cannabis, but they should have the right to access food products, tinctures, capsules, lotions. What you would think is the government would then, they're making all these companies to grow all this marijuana under the new system, but they would license those companies to also make extracts in some kind of way and sell those to patients. But that's not what they're going to do. What they're going to do is they're saying, okay, patients can make it themselves, but no one else can help them. We're not going to sell it to you. And if you help, if someone helps you, that person is manufacturing marijuana, and they will be charged. Now, realistically, no patient was getting charged for making their own products, but certainly they were breaking the law. They were manufacturing marijuana by turning their marijuana into cookies or a lotion or whatever. And some products, it's not too hard to make cookies in your own home, although it's not easy either, but to make a, a lotion or a tincture or a capsule, it takes a amount of expertise. It's a demand a patient make that on their own. It doesn't really make any sense. Any more than saying, oh, you need penicillin? Here's a loaf of bread. Let it go moldy and make your own penicillin, right? I mean, you should have the right to make these own things in your home. As long as you're doing it safely, you should be allowed. But it shouldn't be the only option for you. You should be able to buy them or access them in some other way. And that's what dispensaries that are out there now, all of which operate in this gray area of the law where there's no legislation that allows dispensaries to operate, but there are a lot of court decisions where judges say, I'm giving you a discharge because you're really helping the community and these laws are done. So we got this weird system where dispensaries are allowed, but they're not allowed. Several got raided in 2011 and their trials are coming up over the coming months. And hopefully we'll see them getting discharges and being released uh, uh, from that. And if they do, that'll bode well for dispensaries continuing to operate. If the judges decide, no, we're gonna hand out some severe penalties now, that'll really put a chilling effect and it'll empower the RCMP much more motivated to go and bust other dispensaries out there. But what we offer, all dispensaries offer a wide range of products that are non-smokable from foods and capsules. And the one thing I like to talk about is the, is the topical applications, the creams and, and lotions and that kind of thing. Because people don't think of cannabis or marijuana medicine as something you rub on your skin. But these things are incredible treatment for arthritis, for eczema, for psoriasis, for pain, post-surgical pain, or local pain, for muscle spasms, for all kinds of ailments, these creams and lotions are incredibly beneficial. They're made, they're rich in cannabis, they're made with psychoactive cannabis products, but there's no intoxicating effect, no psychoactivity. Maybe if you ate a lot of the cream, you might get a little high, but you're not going to be able to. It's a body cream, and it's simply not designed to be eaten. And probably you'd throw up before you really got the effect out of it. But as a topical application, they're amazing. And I believe in a fully legalized future where cannabis is fully integrated, that will be the way most people use cannabis. Even people who have no desire to get high and who are against marijuana will still have a jar of this miracle cream in their cabinet because it works so well. And that product you can put on the babies, it can be sold in London drugs or whatever. It's the kind of thing that really will become more widespread. And although people are always gonna smoke cannabis, and smoking cannabis can be really good medicine, I think a lot of those who currently smoke cannabis would move to non-smokable forms if they had the option. But aside from a dispensary, there's not a lot of places you can get those kind of products, and you can't tell what it is. A cookie that's going to knock you unconscious and one that has got no cannabis in it look exactly the same. And so it's very hard to titrate your dose and find a reasonable you know, uh, product when you're on, on the underground market. But if you know this cookie is going to be the same as the last cookie, this capsule is going to have this effect, there's a label on the tincture telling you how to use it. If you have those options, I think a certain amount of people that are smoking cannabis now would rather do it a different way. And uh, for most of European history, people used cannabis in tinctures. And that was the way cannabis was used medicinally in Canada up until the 50s. Really, most of it was in tincture format. That was the way it was mostly used, not really smoking. Smoking became popular during the 50s and after that. But since for the most of history, it was tinctures. Sure, it's just that the patients, uh, although you're right, they're uh, not aware of any patient being arrested for producing their own uh, byproducts. 
they often come into conflict with housing authorities, with neighbors, it uh, uh, reduces their privacy rights because suddenly neighbors are complaining about smell. A neighbor might be complaining about a smell even from a federally authorized food service, say has HIV AIDS, et cetera, and suddenly they have to reveal their condition in their entire neighborhood, et cetera. So, so it has, and I, I'm fully aware of people being kicked out of social housing because they've been producing butter and other, uh, other byproducts within their home and that creates smell. Yeah, so it make a lot of sense. Yeah, vulnerable yeah absolutely. Well. And some extracts can be dangerous to produce in your own home too. Like you take sure or butane and things. I'm not even in favor of butane extracts at all, but certainly the sh extracts that you saw them should be made under laboratory, laboratory, laboratory conditions and not in your own home. Really. Right. But you can make cookies and yeah. some things quite well, safe in the right home. Have to. Yeah, well, exactly. I mean, it doesn't make a lot of smell. It can be quite even more than smoking. Making food products can be an issue for a lot of people. So there's those kind of aspects to it. Um, I think I saw your hand up there. Yeah. Um, well, uh, to the EDM, uh, do you ever have Absolutely, absolutely. And smoking is, I mean, it's, it's smoking can be good medicine, but it's certainly, you can't do it in your workplace. If you're, you know, a younger person who uses medical cannabis, if you're in class and you reek like pot, it's going to cause problems for a lot of people. There's a lot of places where you don't want to smell like cannabis just because of the way it is. And actually, one other thing, which is kind of a new trend, but juicing whole cannabis plants is really becoming a popular technique. I've never done it. We don't offer it at our dispensary. It's kind of problematic to provide it in some ways, but People juice immature plants that are smaller. They juice the leaves, they juice the buds, they juice the whole plants. And from what I've been seeing, it's very effective and really helpful for a lot of people. And uh, it's, it's really kind of a newer trend out there that's still really being investigated. So it's juicing the hemp plant, the hemp plant is, um, as opposed to the cannabis, medicinal plant, this whole is the medicine to use that. Yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely, and I'll, I'll kind of expand on that a little bit because because what we call hemp, what we call marijuana, it's kind of an arbitrary distinction. They're different types of the cannabis plant, but it's all one plant from one species. What we define legally as hemp in Canada is cannabis that has been bred to be very low in THC. It's got to have less than 0.03% THC in the top third of the plant. Or it's a very low amount of THC anyways. So what they do, when you're growing hemp for fiber, you grow tall, hermaphrodite plants, and you normally harvest before they go to flower. So there's not many cannabinoids made in the plant that way. When you grow hemp for seed, you grow it kind of marijuana style. You grow short, squat plants with big buds. You cull most of the males out of the field, but you leave a few males behind so they can pollinate the females. And when you have these rich buds full of seeds, when they harvest them, they have the machine that extracts all the seeds and mulches up all the buds and puts them back in the field. They can't use those buds or sell them, they're not permitted to under their license, right? But those buds are rich, not so much in THC, but in a chemical called CBD. And there's a wide variety of different cannabinoids, there's CBD, CBG, CBN, T, different kinds of THC, there's all different kinds of chemicals. And what we're learning is that CBD has actually got more medicinal benefits than <coughs> THC does. Now for some things, THC is better, THC is more psychoactive as well, and for some things, the psychoactivity is part of the medicinal effect, but CBD is better at destroying cancer cells and shrinking tumors. CBD is better at stopping spasms and helping with spasmodic ailments, and CBD's got a pretty broad range of medicinal effects. And sometimes CBD plus THC together really gets the effect you want. Many people find that pure THC is too speedy and too intense and doesn't, doesn't really produce a, a pleasurable kind of high experience, but THC plus CBD together produces a more pleasurable kind of experience, right? So, so when our hemp farmers are grinding all this buds back and putting it back in the field, they're really wasting the most valuable part of their hemp plant. If they could be educated and, and, and legally empowered to gather up those flowers as well, to process them in an industrial kind of scale, to extract the cannabinoids out of them, each plant might not be incredibly potent. When you've got 100 acres, you're producing a lot of cannabinoids and they can very easily extract that product out and make very powerful medicinal products that are very cheap to produce and very effective. And I would love to do some talks to our hemp farmers and try to get more of them on board saying, hey, why are you making us shred and destroy the most valuable and useful part of our crop? It would be amazing if those farmers could gather up all that stuff and make 
some kind of CBD extract, sell it to me, sell it to someone else who runs a dispensary, sell it to a mainstream company to, to make a lotion or a food product out of, that would be wonderful. It would make our farmers a lot of money, it would produce incredibly cheap and effective plant-based medicines, and it would be a wonderful situation. But right now, that's not allowed, and all that stuff gets mulched back into the fields again. But I like sort of shifting the paradigm of marijuana and hemp and what this medicine is, because really it's a lot more complicated than just smoking a joint off of a of marijuana plant. There's a lot of other ways to use this medicine and to, and to, and to adjust it. Anybody else want to know anything? Yes. Given that it's such a scam that this is illegal, and you know that meanwhile you know we have like cotton for clothing and stuff uh, going on, and, uh, which to my knowledge is you know inferior in every way, but and then the story is about the newspapers who own forests who didn't want hemp paper competition being at the root of it. Um, do you think we might wake the giant here? Well, you know, there are powerful forces that are against cannabis uh, being legalized, absolutely, and changing these laws. And yet, uh, we've had a lot of victories over the last uh, while. We've seen a lot of increase. A lot of American states have allowed medical cannabis. Two out of the three states that tried to legalize through a referendum had a victory. In Oregon, they came very close, but did not get over the top. They also had a vote there as well, at the same time as Washington and Colorado did. So there are powerful forces against this. The most notably in Canada, the RCMP is a very big one. And they certainly have had a powerful influence in many elections across our country. So politicians are sometimes afraid of going against the RCMP because they know they'll get a backlash against them from the police force. Uh, in 1996, when the liberals were putting in their new drug laws, which legalized hemp, which was great, but which also had a lot of cracking down on cannabis and drugs in other ways, it wasn't so good. But they actually held hearings and discussions. When the conservatives passed their drug law, they just stuck it in an omnibus bill. There's no debate, we're going to pass it. The Liberals, to their credit, had a discussion, had hearings, and then ignored most of the testimony that they got. But it's, it's, it's instructive to see what happened when they had that testimony. I was just getting into the marijuana reform field at the time, and I followed that very closely. They had dozens of groups come and speak to them about their new drug laws. The, the Department of Toronto, Department of to Toronto, Department of Public Health, the Canadian Bar Association, the Ontario Criminal Lawyers Association, the Addiction Research Foundation, the Canadian Medical Association, Every single group that testified said, prohibition has failed, this is a bad law. The only two groups that said, no, we like this new law, it's a good idea. That was the RCMP and the Canadian Pharmaceutical Association. So make of that what you will, but of all those groups, the only two that said they like the way this is going and they think these new drug laws are great, it's the RCMP and the Pharmaceutical Association. And certainly, both of those groups profit greatly from cannabis being illegal in Canada. Uh, but I do think that we can change this, and many individuals in those organizations, I think, are recognizing the futility of what they're doing and want to make a change. So you think that uh, those two groups would be the same in, in this upcoming? Yeah, they're not the only two, but the thing about this campaign is that it's not about our enemies. It's not about somebody stopping us from doing this. Our only challenge here is ourselves. If we, as a movement, and those who believe in this cannabis law reform, can be organized and motivated and dedicated enough to get this on the ballot. Nobody can stop us from getting it on the ballot. The RCMP can't stop us, the Pharmaceutical Association can't stop us, no one will stop us but ourselves. That's what I like about this campaign, it's up to us to make a difference. If we can get this on the ballot, if we can get it passed, those groups will not be able to stop this law from changing. So that's what our effort is. I'll go to you and then to you. I think another thing we have to do is show those people that people that are using this plant as medicine are responsible citizens. We can't be uh, letting it get out of hand and, and, and having individuals, right, that would show up at a rally or show up to group, you know, cause a disruption and now that kind of reflects on the whole sort of movement again. One of the things we have to sort of like promote along the way is responsible use and responsible, you know, people being responsible in society and being concerned about whether or not what they're using as a medicine and how it affects other people. As long as we keep that that line, we'll, we'll probably do better than you know letting it get a little run away on us. Some people well, will absolutely. Do that. I, I agree with that. That we need to to be responsible and to, to sort of act the way we want things to be under a legalized system. But I'll also say that you know we have events like the 420 rally in Vancouver. This year it's probably going to attract 20,000 people who will be smoking a lot of cannabis on that day. 
And yet, out of those 20,000 people, we rarely see any kind of problems. It's a very peaceful event. The few folks that throw up or act out or start a fight almost always showed up drunk. And then they ate a lot of hot food. And then they got sick. Right? And they passed out. And I have a, I don't know if I put it out here or not, but I've got this great little flyer. I've got some kicking around. I don't think I put them out there. But it's a flyer from the city of Vancouver. It's called Take Care with Cannabis. And it is, I think, the best harm reduction marijuana flyer I've ever seen. It doesn't say marijuana equals heroin equals death. It says, if you're going to smoke marijuana, do it in a responsible way. Be aware of what strain you're using. If you're going to eat some hot food, don't eat it all at once. Have a little bit, wait a while, then try some more later. Be aware of your age. If you're, going to, if you're underage, use cannabis in a responsible way. Try to avoid using it in situations where you're going to have problems. Don't watch out sharing your joint with someone who's got a cold or got the flu, because you might catch the flu if you share a joint with them. Very simple, practical, good advice, right? And that's the kind of stuff we need to be giving people so that, to know how to use cannabis responsibly because there isn't any social structural framework to do that in. You know, we have ads for gambling and know your limit, play within it. And we have ads for alcohol that try to encourage responsible use. We should be doing the same kind of thing with cannabis, right? I mean, it's certainly, you know, not cannabis isn't for everybody, but for those who use it, there's a way of using it that you minimize bothering other people, you maximize your own safety and the benefits. You want to maximize the benefits and minimize any risks or any harm from cannabis. And that, uh, that's the kind of model we need to promote. Well, I'm just saying that that's what the RCMP uses in argument all the time. They're, they're willingly breaking the law. That means that they, can, they just have this anti-law thing, and they try and sort of promote that if you're willing to openly break the law, then that you know, automatically makes you criminal criminal, even if you're being responsible about it, they're just sort of like making the point that you were willing to break a law, that makes you a criminal. You yeah, I, I prefer the Martin Luther King statement that it's your duty to break unjust laws and that unjust laws should not be respected. You have a duty, I think, to follow the laws that are reasonable and logical, and that, that's part of being society, but you also have a duty to stand up against laws that are unjust and unfair, but you have to do it in the right way, to have the most effect in your, in your campaign. Did you? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Well, I guess from a practical perspective, getting the actual signatures is a challenge. Uh, yeah, I think logistically in areas like Victoria, it's relatively easy to get signatures to students to do it all the time. For those as long as they're registered voters. Right, yeah. Um, but uh, I'm just thinking logistically, I think the biggest challenge uh, would definitely be rural areas uh, in Prince George and other areas. Uh, and, and from between now and when the petition gathering begins, uh, what kind of things can be done to increase the chance of having a logistical organization to put those signatures hit the 10% threshold? Well, I'd say actually, I'm not sure if, if your premise is correct. It's true that rural areas have our big challenge, but urban areas are too in a different kind of way. Rural areas, you're right, they're more spread out. You've got to have people in different towns working on it, but often the population base is less, so you might only need 2,000 or 3,000 signatures to get over the top. Whereas in urban areas like Surrey, for instance, with very great population density, you need over 5,000 people to sign on board in that area. So although they're all more closely packed together, it's a different kind of a strategy, right? So I've been traveling around the province and I've been going almost exclusively to the central interior, northern interior. I've been to Prince George. I've been all around the northern areas, building up our base and finding those people in those communities who will, who will support our campaign and get people registered. And we're going to be doing that again and again over the coming months. Uh, we're also planning on putting on about 15 bigger panel discussions around the province as well. We did one in Victoria last September. We had 500 people come out for that. That was a great event. But it cost a few thousand dollars to put something like that on. So we had to get our fundraising in place and get that organized before we could start doing larger events. And in a rural community, having me show up and do a talk to 30 people or 50 people, that's pretty good. But in Surrey, I'd rather put on a bigger event and get 600 people to come out at once rather than it just being me there, right? So that's what we're gonna be doing. Philip Lucas is gonna be really coordinating a lot of that stuff for us. And uh, from late February till about mid-April, we'll be putting on these events, about two a week usually for about six or seven weeks over that time. Are you guys doing fundraising as well? I've got a little donation jar over there, and we are doing fundraising too. I'm working up front, I mean, individuals can help certainly. I'm working on getting businesses to come on board to commit a certain amount each month for the next 10 months because of the length of this campaign. It's easier than just getting one big donation to make several smaller ones over the course of a year. And it's gonna cost a lot of money. This will cost at least a half a million dollars, if up to a million or more, I would say. But I'd say the low end to succeed, we're looking at about half a million dollars. And I'm hoping to raise that from a combination of businesses and dispensaries putting money in, from individuals putting money in. There's also a fellow named Bob Herb and Terrace who won the lottery recently. He's pledged to make some significant donations to our campaign. 
can't do it all himself, but that'll certainly help and probably be one of our biggest donors. And, uh, and so between those three groups, individuals, businesses, and our friend in Terrace, I think we can get at least half a million dollars. But it's a big struggle and a big effort to get that money in there. And we're running a, you know, this campaign on the smallest possible budget that we can. Uh, but I would say that so far, it's actually been more successful than I anticipated. We've still got a long way to go. The Vancouver Sun has endorsed us at an editorial that was wonderful with our website there and telling people to get involved. Black Press, which runs most of the smaller town newspapers in BC. Uh, last year, they were running a rotating editorial through, through several of their papers, uh, uh, advocating for our campaign. We've had amazing response from local papers and pretty much every reporter that comes out I go to sports are doing it now, I'm gonna give you good coverage. Like they all really like, you know, they're they're in favor of what we're doing, right? So we're getting good media coverage. And having Bob win the lottery was certainly I didn't plan oh someone's gonna win the lottery. <laughs> so that was a big help as well, right? So I feel like that things are going well for us. We're gonna need a few more lucky breaks like that to really succeed in this campaign, but I'm feeling pretty good so far. We've registered about ten thousand people so far, which is a great start. But it's a long way from the 400,000 hoping to get registered by September, right? So, and even if we don't have everybody pre-registered, as long as we've got a good chunk to get a good head start in there, and as long as we've got our volunteers in place all around the province, that I think is the key. But, um, but it's going to be a challenging campaign, and uh, and we need a lot of volunteers. And in some areas, like in Kelowna, they're having an event every week. They've got a real dedicated crew. They're doing, they're going to the bridge and hanging out with signs. They're going door knocking. They're going to concerts. They're going to sporting events. They're signing up people, right? And we need that, and we got a few others like that, but we need that all around the province. Right? We need people at, at events and doing things, talking, promoting, getting the word out there, and believing in this. And when September comes, I don't want people going, yeah, I signed something about pot six months ago. I kind of forget, some guy came and talked about something. People gotta be going, yes, the time is here. I'm gonna sign, I'm gonna get 100 signatures. We're gonna legalize, do it now. We gotta build up that momentum and that excitement to make this work. And I think we're on track for that, but uh, but like I said, it's gonna be a big effort. And I certainly cannot do it all myself. I need everybody in this room, and everybody in every room that I've talked to over the last four months to like put in some time and effort and get involved to make this succeed. And one of the key differences in US initiatives, they can pay for uh, paid collectors. Uh, That's right. They go around and pull and collect. You can pay, so you can, and there's companies that just do that stuff. And I actually, I mean, although it's a challenge for us, although, I, but I actually kind of, I like that in a way, Although it makes it harder for us, because in California, although I'm all for more referendums, the corporations are able to sort of buy their way onto the ballot, and that's not, I think you can have too many referendums as well as not enough, but here in BC it could be a lot easier. If they would just lower the threshold to like 5% of the registered voters in the province, covering two-thirds of the districts, that would still be a high threshold, but it would be a little better to actually get things on the ballot. But that's a, maybe we can have a referendum on fixing the referendum system, but that's a whole other, a whole other debate really. Uh, can the signatures be electronic or do they have to be hand signed? When people pre-register, they can sign up on our website, everything is the same thing. When they actually do it, it's got to be a piece of paper. It's actually a different piece of paper for each electoral district. So in rural areas, it's not a big deal because they're all the same one. Here in Victoria or even more in Vancouver or any big urban center, if you're getting people in a, in a place like this to sign on, you're going to have to have 20 different forms depending which district they're from. And as a canvasser, you have to register as a canvasser when the time comes. So in September, before September, once you file it, if you want to gather signatures, you've got to fill out a form, fax it to me, I've got to sign that form, fax it to Elections BC. I talked to the team that did the HST thing, they said that fax machine was running 24 hours a day, Bill Randersham was sitting there signing forms, slapping them back on, sending it to Elections BC. So you've got to be a registered canvasser, and every person who signs up on your sheet you're supposed to be there while they sign it and witness them signing it. So it would be great if people could sign up electronically or something else, but that's not how it works. And they've all got to be registered voters as well, including the canvassers and the signatories. Registered voters, everyone. Now we're having an election in May, which will increase the number of voters. People will turn out, hopefully. And anyone can register online. It takes only five minutes to register online. It's very easy. If you go to tinyurl.com slash bcvoter, we may, it's a much longer link to the Elections BC website. And we have that in our flyers. It only takes a few minutes to register, and we'll be pushing for that more as we go along to make sure everyone is registered in advance. But right now, we just want to get volunteers in place and get people signed up, and then we'll work on educating all of our volunteers and everyone who's signed up over the summer to make sure everyone's engaged and ready to go. Uh, with the uh, election coming up so soon, have many politicians waited on your No, most have not waited on our campaign. I don't know, other than Nicholas Simons, who came to our initial event in Victoria and talked to us there. Um, 
The NDP, although I met with many of them last April in person, I talked to about 25 different MLAs, and for the most part, they were very supportive of what we're doing, but we're not necessarily willing to lend a lot of their political support to our campaign. They believe in it, they want to make it happen, but they're being told this is not something we're gonna campaign on in the coming election, right? So NDPers will tell me, just get us elected, we'll deal with it afterwards, we'll do something good, trust us, but we're not gonna talk about it before the election. That's, that's better than saying, get out of my office but it's certainly not really the commitment that I want, right? And I, I do kind of wonder why our politicians are afraid of this issue, because it's got more public support than any political party gets in British Columbia to change these laws. But I think that they're afraid uh, that certain groups are against it. They're afraid that perhaps those who support marijuana law reform are not voters, they're not gonna vote for them. They're afraid of challenging the RCMP and getting into a fight with the police force over this when they'd rather not have make more enemies if they can avoid it. And, uh, and so it's, it's a challenge. And I haven't done as much inroads into the Liberal Party, uh, partly because I'm kind of an NDP here, although this is a nonpartisan campaign. Absolutely, everybody is welcome, conservative, liberal, green, NDP, whatever party, or non-political, whatever. They're all welcome in this campaign. And I've had conservatives come to some of my events. They're a minority, to be sure. But I've had people come say, I'm the president of my conservative riding association, but on this issue, I want to see the laws change. And so it is a nonpartisan campaign. But, uh, but in terms of getting them to say, yeah, we really support it, we haven't had a lot. And if they would, we don't have to have a referendum. The referendum is only because they're not going to pass it. If the, it'd be much better, I'd be much happier if the NDP got into power or if Christy Clark decided to pass this now and we could skip the whole referendum process and just make this law go into place. That would be much better, really, because it would save us a bunch of time and money, it would save the province millions of dollars of putting on a referendum and, and all the expense of having a ballot initiative campaign. Uh, but the best way to force our political leaders to take a stand is to work towards a referendum and build support in that way. And it also gives us a hook in the media. If it's just me, I'm gonna lie, well, we should pass it. That's not as interesting to the papers as we've got a campaign, we're gonna have a referendum. That gives them a story to talk about. And so for all those reasons, we're having this referendum campaign. But ultimately, you know, I wish, and I'm an NDP here, I wish my party would support this law and if you go through. It's our party policy, I know, because I wrote it and passed it in 2003, um, but they don't talk about it very much and they're afraid, I think, of, of the negative feedback they would get from this. And that's why I encourage you to talk to your MLA and say, I'm only voting for you if you support the Central Policing Act, or I certainly want to see this law put into place. Why don't you pledge to do it? And that would certainly help a lot. I'm just gonna say when you register people to the website, <laughs> Well, that's a good idea, and we're kind of working on something like that. It's actually a challenge. We had to write our own script to associate every postal code with a district. They don't make the information publicly available to you. And in fact, Canada Post claims that the postal code list is their proprietary information. And if you reproduce that and publish it, they will, they've done this, they will sue you and say, you can't put that online. We sell that information to people. We make money off of that. Which makes no sense to me because it's a public information. It's it's like there. It's not they don't own the postal code list, right? But we had to write our own script so that we could sort all the people who are in our system <coughs> into which district they're in so we can find out. And although it's not we do have an automated thing where you can email Christy Clark and Adrian Dix right now, but we haven't got one for your MLA yet, but we are working on that and I'm hoping to set that up. And we'll also be encouraging those who have already signed on board to contact their MLA. Here's a form letter you can send, it's better for changing your salary, but here's the basis and so we're working on that. Hopefully we'll have all that in place in a couple of weeks. Uh, is there any precedence of Section 56 of the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act um, used to exempt a class of persons on the basis of their problems? No. That act, that legislation has been used for the first hemp farmers and for the first medical marijuana patients. They, they used that, act, that law when the very first people were going to court and getting the right to get medical cannabis the Minister of Health would use Section 56 to say that you can use cannabis. So Terry Parker, an epileptic fellow who went to courts quite a few years, he got a Section 56 exemption. But um, that's mostly where it's been used. But once they started getting hundreds and then thousands of applications, they moved away from that procedure and instead created the medical marijuana program. So the Section 56 has not really been used very much at all. I'm not aware of it being used really that much before this recent thing. Normally it was used for like a researcher or a scientist who wanted to grow some cannabis or, or get some drugs or do some things, <laughs> some, do a study of some kind. Normally it was used for that kind of research-based based application. But it's fully within the jurisdiction to do so. It is, it is there for that purpose and it could be used for that purpose. Or they could just pass a law 
if they wanted to just say we're going to exempt BC as well. Like they don't have to use that procedure, but it is there, it's in place, and it could be used for this. It was used but, for insight too. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Insight was also came under Section 56, and it still does actually. And the minister tried to take it away, and the court said no, you have to give them a Section 56 exemption to stay open. So it was used for that as well, you're right. Any more questions? Or we're going to go from 2 to around 3.30 or 4, so I can have to chat a little more if anybody's got anything else. Oh. Yeah, sure. So, um, my name is Sam Beckins. I'm the one who posted uh, some of these flyers. I don't know if you've seen it. If you do go to the school, I posted it. I have a couple spots here and in the building over there. Um, I have a uh, over at downtown, I think the place is called uh, Jupiter.
trying to keep uh, keep up there. So there's a lot of uh, great things happening in the states and of Hawaii. Somebody, that, uh, I don't know if you know that in Hawaii, the uh, not the MP, the, uh, the governor. The gov yeah, the governor has in has put forward. state where they legalized hemp cultivation, although it's done as an experimental thing, it's behind a big high barbed wire fence or whatever, but Hawaii is the only state where the government, without a referendum, the government said, we're going to try to grow some hemp here, we're going to open things up in that way. And it's because the population is very small, and the smaller the population, the more of a chance individual citizens have a chance to talk to the government, and to have an impact and make things happen, right? And so, uh, so that's great if Hawaii is talking about legalization, and a few other legislators in other states have also come forward. They may not all pass, but they're being emboldened by what happened in Washington, Colorado, and saying we're going to try to pass something here too. And it's really good seeing that kind of movement come forward, even if they don't all end up passing and succeeding. It's great to see that that positive forward momentum happening. And then across Canada, there's a sensible Canada Facebook group um, that uh, I guess I've been posting too much now. My posts are moderated, <laughs> but um, that's uh, basically a Canada dis discussion. On Still be supporting a legally 
labor in the system. That's the best way to reduce any harm is the democracy in cannabis and cannabis use. So take some of the, if you want to help out, grab some of these sheets, get your friends and family and people to put their information down on it. You can mail it to us at the address at the bottom. You can fax it, you can scan it and email it. I mean, you can probably take a picture with your iPhone as long as it's good enough quality and send it to us that way as well. But, uh, but this is how you can help out. You can do stuff on, on, on Facebook and on the internet as well. Talk to Sam uh, before you leave, give him your information or uh, check the ball, there's a box here, if you want to volunteer, check out that box when you sign up. And uh, we keep the momentum going in Victoria, and you can compete with Cologne and all the other folks around the province and see who can get the most support the fastest in their area. But uh, we need to, can't just be at this meeting and go home and not do anything else. you got to get involved by being here. You're now taking on the responsibility of helping make this campaign a success. And uh, certainly need your help. We also have a lot of flyers other than just the two that are there. Feel free to grab as many flyers and buttons as you like and give them to other people as much as you want. Ted's also got his great Cannabis Digest newspaper here as well. He's got a good article about our campaign in there, a few pages in, so those are free. Grab some of those too. Don't be shy grabbing stuff and uh, help spread the word so we can build this campaign here in Victoria and all around BC. Thank you very much. Thank you.
think he's in there at one point. That's awkward. I think he's in there at one point when Dana.